Okay, hi, my name is Guy Bia Jr. and I am a lecturer and currently the coordinator of graphic design at Columbia College Chicago. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, data type graphics and literature. I usually give a lot of my students projects that involve um, sort of me being a voyeur. I really want to know what, what the kids are into these days. So what I like to do is um, this project basically evolved from um, it used to be an advanced type project, and at Columbia College, we recently revised our BFA program to the point where we did something pretty radical that sort of um, put off a lot of the, uh, I shouldn't say this, put off a lot of the older um, <clears throat> instructors. So well, at Columbia, we had four type classes, and we realized that in over the years of having these type classes and having regular graphic line classes, if a student was in, say, like, uh, an intermediate graph line class and you talk to them about their typography, they would respond by saying, but this isn't a typography class. And so we realized that let's do something radical, get rid of half the type classes, and then incorporate more typography into the graph line classes. So this way they're just getting it so they know that the two are always going to be combined together. So um, the objective is to learn how to gather data and use information design as a structure for complex con content as a vehicle for implementing and enhancing readers' understanding of content, how to interpret and present data in user-friendly applications, and how to use and analyze several different models of basic information design theory. Uh, after completion of the assignment, students should have acquired the ability to gather, interpret, and edit data. Um, to conduct user tests and analyze and report the results, to make appropriate choices in displaying content as well as acquire working knowledge of information design terms. So basically what the project consists of, I, the first day of class I tell the students you have to come back next week or the following class with um, 10 to 15 of your favorite books. I don't care if you're embarrassed by the books, it should be your favorite books. And over the years, um, students have gotten more comfortable with this. So, as a jumping off point, what we've done is um, I've had the students go to Amazon and type in the name of the book into the search mode. And I just say, see what the results come back and don't gather all the information and see what you can find. And that's a jumping off point for them to figure out how popular where their book ranks. And then they have to create a narrative once they um, figure out all the information on it. So it's basically trying to find sort of like these uh, commonalities that they wouldn't have discovered. And so the other part of the project is the fact that where are these books being stored? And so we assign, I assign them uh, an essay by uh, the avant-garde theorist, uh, Georges Perec, that his essay is called The Art and Manner of Arranging One's Books. And he has this conversation with friends about how should you start arranging books or why you should arrange books. Um, so the student starts off by having um, the number of books in her personal library, which is 64, and then she classifies them by classics, cultural theory, design, fiction, graphic novels, history, nonfiction, philosophy, plays, poetry, and reference. And to the other side of the spread, what she shows is she creates these little icons that are going to direct the reader into if it's a personal rating, a visual appeal, size, genre, if she's read it at home or school, and nostalgic attachment. So I'm going to show just three or four spreads of, of several students. I've been doing this for, for a few years and um, I can't show like entire books. Um, so the requirement of, uh, the other requirement of the project is the fact that they have to include Prex text throughout the uh, assignment. So they're dealing with one level with this Prex text, um, their narrative, the information line they've gathered from other sources, and then um, any other information they can find about the book that relates to it. Um, so Basically what happens is that this comes out as a, um, so th this project is, is in a class called Graphic Design 4, which is um, narrative and research. And so this sort of prepares them to start gathering information. So you could see, so for example, the Catch and Ride, which is uh, to my surprise, and I actually really like it that a lot of students are still reading the Catch and Ride. Um, so they have the information of when it was published, who's the publisher, when they read it, where it sits next to in their library. Um, and then they also have uh, a little description about Catch and Rye, and then they have a personal narrative about why they like to Catch and Rye. So these, some of these end up being pretty standard sort of um, grid and typographic layouts. Um, because we want the students to, to still have this information because we want the, 
the information to be easily read by other people who aren't familiar with these books. And being graph graphic students, you realize that there's a lot of these books that come up over and over again. So some students will do sort of what the assignment entails, and some students will go out. And so each student, this student, uh, Sammy, decided that she wants to write at least one sentence narrative that describes how she really feels about the book. So she describes The Knife of Never Letting Go as a tearjerkers, and she writes, while this book is action-packed, badass, uh, and a social commentary, you're still going to need a whole box of tissues. Um, the book thief, books in which, in, books in which one encounter at least one, once the word book, and she writes, uh, 319 number of, 319 is the number of times a book, the word book is used, and then she just says, this goes without saying. Um, so the bell jar of Sylvia Platt, she says, books doomed to fall on deaf ears, so she does some from information, she realizes that there's, there were 18,000 number of lobotomies performed in the U.S. from 1939 to, 19, to 1951. One in 370 ratio of those deemed insane to sane early 20th century, and in 1945, the year lithium was introduced as a medical drug. Knowledge and understanding of mental disorders was severely lacking at the time Platt wrote this semi-autobiographical book, and unfortunately, this lack of understanding continues today. Um, the other book that comes up a lot is Lolita, and it's one of those books that I feel that um, it's, 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 students are very passionate about their take on the content. And so she writes, pedophile or lover? Herbert, in fact, is a pedophile. Look at their ages, but in Herbert's mind, he and Lolita are just two lovers, so 12 to 36. Lolita's age compared to Herbert's at the time of their first meeting. And she writes, it is a book that evokes conflicting emotions. Lolita is simultaneously disturbing and poetic. It is definitely a book I wish I could have talked over with a loved one. I'm like, come on, that's kind of deep for a 19-year-old. Um, so books containing at least one sentence that would make you cry if you dared to read it aloud, and it's, and it's the room. So she says, scale comparison of the size of the room to the size of people living in it. There are many things about this book bound to make one cry, whether read aloud or in one's mind, but Little Jack's contentment with the life in the 11 by 11 shed is enough to make one implode. So then she devises this information graphic where she has, she calls it the happiness continuum, and she says, if a Italio Calvino was right when he, when he wrote that the house, the house is full of books, contains a story of the reader. What does this continuum say about me? And so she says, the continuum shows where each of the aforementioned books lies in comparison to each other in terms of sadness and happiness. And then she just goes on to talk about how she breaks down between the star ratings in Amazon and the ratio of male to female authors. And then if she were arranged it by color. Um, and so one of the key things with a lot of the, the projects that, that I do at Columbia is I don't want the students to sort of have, basically I don't want there to be a stylistic thing that comes out of Columbia. So there's, like, there's a lot of other universities and colleges where you can tell that this is from a particular school. And so I try really hard to have these projects be a personal take on what they want to show. So this is, um, so this student calls the book, uh, they're all supposed to have the name of the uh, uh, Prex essay, but some do subheads, and so this is a uh, books on display. So this is how she's going to display Prex text throughout the book, but I'll only show you one spread of how she does it, and then the rest show where she has her books at. So Sal Bass is a life in film and design. She puts where it's displayed at in the built -on chef, uh, built on chef, and she says reading preference, so she's flipped through it, and she's read specific passages, and reading progress, she's already completed it. Um, so then she describes why it's on display. This is an amazing undertaking of one's designer's contribution to film and design history. It is displayed because of its content and because it's so damn huge. Uh, again, The Catcher in the Rye, uh, she read it cover to cover, uh, reading preferences, specific passages, and she completed it. Uh, why it's on display, this particular edition is collectible and, and printing books like it from other areas. You can noticeably see the ink getting lighter in some parts of the book. It is one of those books you had to read in high school but ended up loving. Uh, Wall and Peace, um, reading preferences, she's flipped through it cover to cover and she's completed it. Uh, Hitchcock, which is the um, book uh, which, is, which Francis Truffaut interviewed Hitchcock about his methodology and she writes, design books are wonderful but I love watching films too. Two iconic filmmakers who define the history of cinema talking in depth together now that's amazing. So she's read it from cover to cover, specific passages, and she's still reading. It's in progress. 
uh, the complete Calvin and Hobbes. And you notice that she has these little illustrations of where she has them in her apartment. So obviously the Calvin and Hobbes um, is on a TV stand. Uh, Wall and Peace is uh, on the coffee table. So it really shows you what students are sort of proud to show throughout their apartment. Um, so this student decided that she wanted to, her 15 books, she wanted to sort of, she realized that they were collectively about strong women. And so she organized them through personal narratives. Um, so this is her contents page. And you can see that they're all very, uh, each, each of the, the books that she involves have uh, strong female characters in it. Uh, Anne of Green Gables. So what she does is that she set up the grid to where um, there's going to be a couple colors and she has a quote that sort of resounds with her. So her quote is, but if you call me Anne, please call me Anne with an E, Anne. And then she describes, so she didn't want to do actual inter information graphics. So she decided that she wanted to have um, certain words that would call out that would be subjective. So instead of graphic, she said, you know, I just want to have these words that would tell people, if you like smart, imaginative, kind, willful, feisty, passionate, ambitious, and curable, you'll like Anne of Green Gables. Uh, the same thing with the Ring of Endless Light. Um, at a great, and a great ring of pure and endless light dazzles the darkness in my heart. Uh, so she says it's creative, brave, honest, generous, wise, romantic, interested, and assured. Uh, she also talks about uh, the gender, how old they are, what's the full name, their hair color and eye color. Uh, Pride and Prejudice. And so she, so what I'm, what I'm actually, what you're looking at now, these are actually book spreads. And so she wanted some of the text to get lost in the binding of the book. That's why the text goes over um, the spread. Because she wanted people to sort of um, try to figure out what it was it, you know, she wanted to make them read the book. Uh, Scott Pilgrim, he's a creep, you're a bitch, and, you're all, and you all deserve each other. Um, so she describes it as combative, sexy, glowing, commanding, mysterious, agile, guarded, and sarcastic. Um, the other thing I want to say is the students, so, so basically what happens is this ends up being a project of a book about books. So the students have to do at least 32 pages, a hardbound book. They have five to six weeks to do it. Um, they have to pick two typefaces, a serif and sans serif. And again, uh, Amazon is the starting point to gather information. Um, so this student decided that she was going to uh, pick her books and then she was going to have the year that it was published and then what happened in that year that the book was published. So Little House in the Big Woods, um, flashback in, in 1932, Amelia Earhart was the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. So on the other side, she has the audience that would read it, the characters, the number of pages, the collection, which is the books, Amazon ratings, and then a quote, which is, they could not be forgotten, she thought, because now is now and it can never be a long time ago, Laura Ingalls Wilder. Oh, sorry. I thought I had a trick for figuring it out, JP, but it's not working. <laughs> okay. Oh. When you go to all white, white, or all black, black, black. Oh boy. Okay. Well, this student used all white, white, so. <laughs> all right, there's an all white, white. Okay. Uh, so this student decided that she wanted to show the reader in the very beginning of the book how she arranged the book. She has a little diagram of where the year, the title, description, author, and where the prep text was going to be. Um, and then she has a list of her texts of, of where her books were going to be. Um, so she arranged it by publication date. The book describes in this publication appear in chronological order of the date where they were written. These books do not include the earliest written book in my collection, which is Beowulf, 8th to 10th century, nor the latest book, The White Tiger. Um, so she has a number of pages, publication date, uh, the difference between fiction and nonfiction, reading level, and uh, the number of books and where they originated from. Um, so her book, one of her books is The Dubliners. Uh, what she describes is 18 times Dublin is submitted for publication, 14 times publishers refused to print Joyce's stories, and one copy survived after a printer set fire to the controversial tales. Um, the Great Gatsby, she says, Hunter S. Thompson retyped The Great Gatsby just to get a feeling of typing a great novel. So I'll go through some of these. Um, 
So this one was pretty unique. So this student realized that all his books in his collection mention food or drink. So he was going to figure out how many times in each book food and drinks was mentioned. So in Ulysses by James Joyce, hard drinks were mentioned 12 times, and soft drinks were mentioned seven times. And in food mentions, he has, uh, there was greater mention of animal between, uh, compared to vegetable. And then he talks about, he does these uh, pie charts that says the difference between how much breakfast, lunch, and dinner were talked about. Um, a portrait of an artist as a young man. Uh, there are four drinks of hard liquor and three of soft. So again, it's, again, Lolila pops up and there's seven mentions of hard drink, unspecified liquor, beer, gin, and pineapple juice, red wine, and then soft, which is tea, water, coffee, ginger ale, milk, Coke with cherry syrup, and orange juice. And he, again, writes a narrative and then he goes on to talk about how each of the books uh, contain uh, food. So that's A Brave New World, which is another book that pops up a lot. Uh, Grapes of Wrath. And this is his overall uh, data information. So he says that the uh, food mentions were 307 time out of his 15 books and 55 mentions of hard liquor and 64 mentions of soft liquor or soft drinks. Um, okay, so this was a recent uh, addition to this presentation. Uh, this student loved the project, but for some reason hated George Preck. She didn't like the idea of a man telling her what to do. Um, so in her narrative, I'll read some of this, she actually argues with Preck. So she says, why? She says, um, does there need to be a problem? It makes sense that a library should be somewhat organized. Not everyone's minds work in the same way, but in your collection, shouldn't you do as you please? Who needs to write formulas and keep tables and th things like this? A library ought to keep a stack of books by the toilet, but why can't you? And while no one likes the guy with 2,000 books he hasn't read, no one has really read Infinite Jest. Is it your given right to give those 2,000 books and throw them all over the place? Um, so she decided she wanted to have all her stuff look like a, an, um, which I was kind of surprised. I didn't know that she knew this, like an old library card, because, you know, students don't go to libraries anymore. Um, so she defines it as borderline personality for girl interrupted, uh, heritage spy, she files under stalker. Um, and then she says here that uh, three hours looking for a book without finding finding it, all right, buddy, you need a new system. Generally, the best policy is to do what makes you happiest, and if wasting three hours of your life tripping over your stacks of decades-old newspapers, I'm looking at you, Prex, so be it. Uh, one full of the cuckoo's nest, she files on a tyrannical monster, and she also has a lot of information, so uh, Mildred is stuck in the literary history as the purest of villains, so easy to arrange. Um, never let me go, she files under weak, because she feels like the main character, Kathy, is weak. Um, and she says, yes, the illusion of perfection, it's an illusion, that's the point, Preck, you're beautiful bastard. The sooner you embrace the fact that you're disillusioned, the sooner you can start living life. Um, Hamlet, she files on a disillusioned, so. Um, so I have two more. So this student uh, decided he wanted to have, his favorite books were sci-fi books. So he decided to create this um, system where eyeglasses meant that it was a nerdy book, the school chair meant that it, was, it could be assigned to uh, an assigned reading through school. So the Dune, Dune Chronicles was an early book. There was a lot of argument about some of these things. I'm a big sci-fi person, and I actually thought that 1984 should have been like a, a really nerdy book. Um, Fahrenheit 454, another one I thought it should have been a nerdy book. So he talks about how um, his, his story in a nutshell, what's the rating, uh, Prex text, and then he talks about if you love this book, how likely is it you're a nerd, and how likely is this book to be required for uh, reading. Let me go through these. Uh, so this is the last one. So Jen realized that in her books that it was time within time. So uh, her books, um, she did a pie chart about um, the, the, the Amazon ratings, a timeline including data novel begins and year of publications, author's birth. So less than zero takes place over four weeks. Uh, One Florida Cuckoo's Nest takes over six weeks. 100 Years of Solitude is a time warp because it, it goes back and forth in time. Uh, this is book relations. So she says if you like less than zero, you'll probably like One Florida Cuckoo's Nest. A uh, Million Little Pieces has been thrown out to the side because you know uh, Oprah really loved it in the beginning. And then Oprah realized that the author exaggerated and so um, the student felt like no one would read it, so it's sort of like Oprah give it and Oprah take it away, and coming from Chicago, that's a lot. Um, so really quickly, 
So she devises her grid where she has the description of the book and then the first sentence of every book. So in less than zero, people are afraid to merge on freeways in, the, in Los Angeles. 100 years of solitude, many years later, as he faced the firing squad. So it just, just goes on and on. Sorry, I'm out of time. Um, thank you. Thank you.